The machine learning includes a wide range of different techniques, but the area that's getting the most interest at the moment and seeing a lot of uh, interest, particularly in healthcare, is the area of deep learning. So what is deep learning? Why is it gaining so much interest? And what might this mean for healthcare? In the last video, we talked about neural networks and gained some of the intuition about how they work. In this video, we're going to talk about deep learning, which is a specific subset of neural networks. I'm just going to focus on the kind of high level understanding and what I think would be worth knowing if you're someone coming from a medical background and want to understand deep learning. I'm not going to go into deep detail about how these algorithms work. But before we delve into it, I think it's worth just taking a quick step back and seeing where this all fits in. I mentioned in an earlier video, this diagram here. So we have artificial intelligence, which is the performance of tasks that require human intelligence by computers. You have machine learning, which is a whole range of techniques that are used to achieve this, uh, where the defining feature is that the machine learns how to perform those tasks. It doesn't just follow the rules that we give it. And then within that, you have neural networks and within neural networks, you have deep learning. Um, so this is a specific type of technique that's used to achieve artificial intelligence. And the difference between deep learning and the previous neural networks that we talked about are that these are deep neural networks. And what that means is that they have multiple layers in between these input and these output layers. And basically, as these networks get deeper, you can actually kind of vary the architecture and you can try and get them to do different types of tasks. Um, and it turns out that some of those tasks and some of these types of architectures of deep neural networks that we can use are actually very helpful in medicine. And there's two particular types of structure of neural networks uh, that are really exciting and kind of being used in deep learning. And if there's one thing I want you to take away from this video, it is that the first of these architectures called the convolutional neural network, which are CNNs for short, those are used for analyzing images. And the second type, which is recurrence neural networks, or RNNs for short, are used for uh, analyzing what we call sequential data. So sequential data is where the natural sequence within that data is important. And that includes things like sequences of blood test results. So you have blood tests at different points in times. It also includes things like genetic sequences because each sequence comes after the previous point in the sequence. It also includes things like text because actually in a sentence, the positioning is very important. So having one word after another one is also very important. And so the key benefit of these two approaches to deep learning in medicine is that it enables us to analyze new types of information, images, text, sequential data, and these kinds of data that we couldn't really analyze very well before. Um, but now that we have these techniques, it opens up a whole realm of possibilities within medicine because we have all these images that are performed every day, chest x-rays, CTs, MRIs. We have all this data being collected, such as typed notes, ECGs, audio recordings, genetic information, uh, all these things that we previously couldn't ana analyze as easily or in the same sort of way. We now have deep learning that basically enables us to analyze these. There were techniques that were used before deep learning came around, but it turns out that deep learning basically enables us to perform much higher level on these types of tasks. And because in medicine, we don't want to accept errors that might harm people, um, using these algorithms to get that kind of level of performance is necessary in order for these to potentially be used in healthcare settings. So both these CNNs and RNNs have a huge amount of potential to be applied to healthcare and it's a very active research field at the moment. In particular, CNNs are getting a lot of attention because there's so much focus on medical imaging um, and also because there's some things that are easier about developing CNNs for medicine because we actually often have a lot of data sets that we, we need to use to train these algorithms, such as um, data banks of chest x-rays or data banks of CT scans. So to give an idea of some of the work that's already been done, there was a collaboration between DeepMind and Moorfield Eye Hospital. And what they did was they looked at about 15,000 retinal scans and they trained a CNN to classify whether or not there was pathology or not on the retinal scan and also to make decisions about whether or not they should be referred for further specialist input. In dermatology we've seen a lot of papers. Uh, an early one of these looked at about 130,000 skin lesions uh, both cancerous and non-cancerous and trained a convolution neural network in order to classify whether or not these skin lesions were cancerous or not um, and again achieved a pretty high uh, performance. Within radiology there was a group from Stanford that trained an algorithm on about 100,000, uh, 140,000 I think it was chest x-rays um, to try and di diagnose different sorts of pathologies. There's several different groups in China who have looked at analyzing colonoscopies. So when a person performs a colonoscopy uh, and you're looking for these polyps, they'll have an AI algorithm which is also looking for the polyps and flags up any polyps that potentially they miss. You may have heard about how the Apple smartwatch uh, enables you to passively detect atrial fibrillation. And that again uses convolutional neural networks to recognize whether or not they're in atrial fibrillation or whether it's a normal ECG. The Google Health team developed a convolutional neural network to screen for breast cancers. And they found that as a second screener, it did perform better than humans typically would. So there's a whole host of different ways it's being applied. I'm just scratching the surface with these examples. There's really a huge number of really fascinating and interesting papers being published at the moment. And I will leave some links in the description below to what I think are probably some of the best papers to read if you're relatively new to the area. And so there has been some kind of wider discussion about the role of CNNs and whether they're going to replace radiologists. Uh, if you're interested in that, I have made a previous video where I did discuss that in a bit more detail. 
And then looking at recurrent neural networks, a key application is the analysis of text. Um, and this is something that we technically call natural language processing. Um, and there's a number of companies looking at exploring, building these models to try and analyze text um, and be able to pick out relevant features. So for example, identify when the text is talking about a symptom or the severity of a symptom, um, or if there's certain topics that are being mentioned that have kind of relevant predictive value. I saw a research study where the group was trying to predict who was at risk of committing suicide and they found that by analyzing the electronic health records and seeing the types of things that were um, entered into those records it gave kind of some indication of what sort of risk each individual would have for trying to commit suicide while they were an inpatient in that hospital. But in terms of natural language processing and applying that to healthcare there are some challenges that are quite specific to healthcare. So for example we tend to use quite a lot of esoteric terms within medicine. One example of this is within the mental mental state exam for psychiatry patients, uh, typically we will describe their affect um, and we might say they have a flat affect and that kind of points towards them having schizophrenia. But using this kind of terminology of a flat affect, that's quite specific to medicine. Like we wouldn't really say that in normal conversation. So if you're trying to train a model to understand what we mean by flat affect, you don't have a lot of data to train that on because you don't have a lot of examples of that being used within common discussion. You would therefore need to have a lot of data specifically of using that kind of within a healthcare context. And one of the tricky things about getting access to large amounts of healthcare data is obviously the privacy and the fact that a lot of the data is in specific different hospitals and it's not easy to you know, share all those data together. Um, particularly, that's my experience in the in UK, I know it's the case in the US as well. Um, I think there are some countries where that's less the case, but ultimately it makes it quite hard for us to train these models that will pick out these kind of medical nuances and these terms that are quite specific to medicine. But that being said, there are multiple companies working in this space. You have Amazon Medical Comprehend, you have Rome, you have Invenio. There's definitely a lot of value to be had, but it's a little bit trickier, uh, I think, than, for example, doing medical imaging with convolutional neural networks because within medical imaging you actually can get collated data sets a bit more easily. You can kind of build up a whole data set of all the chest x-rays that are performed in a particular um, hospital. You can de-anonymize those. You can share those as a public data set and then that can be used by multiple research groups around the world um, and it's a lot easier to do. Whereas with text it's quite hard sometimes to de-anonymize things because there'll be certain things within the text that maybe describe things that are specific to a particular patient and generally it's, it's a bit harder to do. So if you look at the current research, there's much fewer studies that have been published that are using recurrent neural networks and there's far more that are using convolutional neural networks. So as I said, I'm not going to go into the deep technical details, but I am just going to um, kind of give a, a sort of overview of what CNNs and RNNs actually do. So firstly, if we talk about convolutional neural networks, I think the first thing to appreciate is just how this data is actually put into the uh, algorithm for it to be processed. And basically the way that, that works is that you have the images, but they're encoded on a computer as numerical values. And these are values of the kind of strength of the pixels. So for each of these pixels within this image, you will have a numerical value for red, green, and blue. That's the way that we um, tend to do it, the kind of three primary colors. Uh, if it's black and white, then you could do it kind of from zero to typically like 256 or so uh, to see like how black or white it is. But essentially, the way that this data is encoded in the computer is for every point you'll have these values. So that's what you're feeding into this convolutional neural network in order to analyze these images. So this is just to give you an overview. Don't worry too much about the details here. But essentially, you're starting off with this image and you're applying it through multiple different layers because it's a deep neural network. And then it's finally giving you the output of trying to classify, you know, whether this is, let's say, a pneumonia on a chest X-ray or not pneumonia. And basically, the way that it works is you have these things called convolutions um, and convolutions are just grids that we perform a multiplication over. So we have our pixel values for the different intensities of 100 or 200 or 150 or whatever and basically we multiply them by these grids which are called convolutions, that's the technical term, and that then kind of gives us a useful output. And what these convolutions do is that different types of convolutions look for different uh, kind of patterns. So here we have one that looks for horizontal lines, one that looks for vertical lines, um, and then lines at different angles. And I'm not gonna go into the maths behind it, but you can do the maths yourself if you're interested. But essentially, if you understand that we have these horizontal lines, these vertical lines, and when you apply it to an image like this, it will extract whatever feature it's looking at. So if you apply this one that looks at vertical lines, and you apply it to this image, you're gonna predominantly get vertical lines from the image. So this would be the output. It would be, you have very kind of white level, white areas, um, so high intensity, where you have these vertical lines. And then if you look at some of the horizontal lines, maybe at the top of the door frame, then that's kind of been lost in this image. Whereas if you instead applied, let's say, a horizontal one, and you're looking at horizontal edges, then this is what you would get. So by applying these convolutions, you're extracting particular features 
of the image. What's useful with this is that we can extract those features and then we can look at combinations of those features and together we can build up a picture of what that image shows. And that's what the convolutional neural network does. So the first layer might look at vertical edges, horizontal edges, different angles, different sorts of colors of like red and white and different sorts of things that it sees on the image. But then what the next layers will do is it will look at combinations. Um, and that's what this demonstrates. So initially we're looking at edges and then we look at combinations of edges. And it seems that if you have an edge like this and then an edge like that, then that might actually suggest um, in the case of face detection, maybe that's a nose or maybe that's kind of an eyebrow or something like that. Uh, so by combining these different features, you're then building up this image. And again, as you progress further down the neural network, you're combining those features more and more. So in the context of faces, uh, you might combine an eye here and an eye here and a nose here, and then that suggests that there's a face. And that's basically what's happening throughout this neural network is it's just kind of building up this image. You're starting out with this simple detection of edges, um, then textures, then objects, and then the overall object or class or, or whatever it is that you're trying to look at. So these are obviously non-medical examples. If we looked at this in a medical context, this could be something like a chest X-ray and you're trying to diagnose pneumonia. So initially it will just detect all the different edges of kind of like the rib shapes, um, you know, the, the, ed the lung borders, um, different kind of levels of opacity in different places. And then by combining those, it will see maybe that you have kind of the diaphragm and maybe you can see the diaphragm border clearly and then you do or you don't have opacity. And it will learn that the ones that do have opacity, that points more towards this being in the category of pneumonia and the ones that don't have that opacity point more towards having a normal chest X-ray. And it's a case of kind of building up um, those, those features throughout the, the convolutional neural network and then using that to distinguish between the two classes that it's trying to uh, classify into, for example. So that's what the network does once it's been trained. Um, but one of the tricky parts is actually training the network in order to do this. And the part of the network that's being trained is these different convolutions. So throughout this network, you have convolutions at different points, um, which will apply things in different ways and look for different sorts of features and combinations of features. And you will update those convolutions in order to learn how best to identify the different kinds of features and the sorts of features that are best at discriminating the specific task you're trying to do. So if you're looking at chest X-rays, or let's use a different example, if you're looking at skin lesions and you're looking at melanoma, then you will be initially picking up um, some kind of edges and some lines. You'll combine those to see what the outline of that skin lesion is. And then you will combine that to see, well, is it a regular border or is it an irregular border? You'll look at the, the kind of pigment within the, the skin lesion and you'll see, okay, it's all quite dark, all quite one color, or maybe there's multiple different patches. You'll have multiple layers that kind of pick that up. And then those features will then be combined. So you'll look at, well, has it got irregular borders? Um, has it got irregular pigmentation? Is it kind of a regular sort of shape? How large is it? Um, how does it kind of fade into the skin around it? That, that sort of thing. And by doing all of that, you then will have this convolutional neural network, which you can give it a new image, which is a skin lesion, and it doesn't know, you know whether it's a cancer or not cancer, but by applying it through those same computations and getting a score for what it thinks is the irregularity, what it thinks is the pigmentation, combining those, it will then give this final output of whether or not it thinks that that is cancerous or not. So then coming on to talk about recurrent neural networks, this is kind of the rough structure of a recurrent neural network. And as you can see, it's taking in things in a kind of time sequence. And that's why it's being used for this sequential data. So typical inputs might be different levels of blood markers at different points in time. So it might be white cell counts, uh, some liver function tests, uh, maybe the vital signs, different variables that are relevant for someone, let's say in intensive care. And you might have those at different points and you kind of feed them all into the algorithm. Or it could be maybe an ECG and you're looking at the displacement of the ECG tracing at each different point and that's being taken in. Or in the case of words and natural language processing, then it might be the individual word. And there's a way that we can encode words for computers, which I'm not gonna go into detail here, but it's essentially having numerical representations of what those words are and what they mean. And then what the recurrent neural network does is it will take in this input at each point. It will again do some computations, some calculations, and then it will decide what of that is quite important to carry on. And then that will take on to the next point. Um, sometimes you'll ask it for an output at a particular moment in time. You might not always ask it for an output. Uh, it depends a bit on how you structure it and what your particular task you're interested in doing is. So basically you, you take the input here, the each recurrent unit, so each of these is called a recurrent unit, will just decide what's important to take and that'll get passed on to the next one. And then so obviously the next unit takes in both the output from the previous unit as well as the new information. And you can kind of take that in over time, build up a picture and then give these outputs. So just to give an idea of what that might look like, 
I've created this uh, kind of artificial um, scenario uh, where let's say we wanted to build a P-wave detector on ECGs. So we have an ECG and we want to train a recurrent neural network which will pick out, you know, am I looking at a P-wave at this moment in time? Uh, so you start off with the ECG. So firstly, you need to encode it as a numerical value. And the way that we could do that is we can look at displacement. So if we say that the baseline here is zero and any value is a displacement away from that baseline. So here we might have zero, three, eight at the peak, six this is coming down, two and then zero. And those are the numbers that we're gonna feed into our recurrent neural network. And we're gonna, all, uh, we're gonna feed them in in that specific sequence. So here's a very simple recurrent neural network. Um, firstly, we feed in zero, then three, then eight, etc. And basically what the network would do is it would it would kind of see here very simply, okay, so it used to be zero and it would kind of record that in a numerical uh, fashion. Then it would see three and eight. And basically the output, once you start getting to here, this output would be, it would be remembering the sort of pattern that it followed. It might not remember it specifically as a sequence zero through eight, but it would remember that it kind of started low and it's gone up to eight um, and then it'll feed it in here and this one will be like, okay, well now we're going down. And by the time you get to this last uh, recurrent unit, you will see that you've kind of gone all the way up and come back down and therefore when it's asked was there a p wave it would suggest that yes there is because it has seen that pattern whereas if you let's say moved along a little bit further along here then it's going to be a bit more flatter it's going to say that there's not a, a p wave um, and then when you get to here it's going to be a much higher peak so because the network's been trained to recognize the, the size of the peak it's going to be like no it's not a p wave it's you know a qrs complex or a t wave for example um, but essentially you're just feeding in this data into the recurrent neural network. It's taking that, it's carrying that information across and then it's accumulating it all and deciding the question that you're asking it to. So here, is there a P wave? Or in another example, it might be, uh, is there atrial fibrillation on this ECG? Or what is the topic that's contained within this sentence? So using these tools opens up a whole new realm of possibilities within healthcare. Um, and that's why it's such a really exciting area of research at the moment, because we've only really been able to develop uh, tools to analyze images and to analyze text to the kind of current standard that we're seeing relatively recently. So there's a lot of low hanging through. There's a lot of really interesting work that's being done. Um, and if it's something that you're interested in, I would highly recommend you know, getting involved and trying to contribute to this because we're really in quite a pivotal period right now where there is a lot of scope for people to get involved and to contribute. If you want to learn about some more advanced concepts, then some things I would suggest looking into are generally adversarial networks, um, looking at transfer learning, and also looking at autoencoders. Those are all interesting areas which are kind of related to deep learning um, and are areas of, of interest at the moment. Uh, but the key thing is just having a good grasp of convolutional, of CNNs, RNNs, broadly how they work and the ways in which they're being applied in healthcare. So in summary, we've talked about how deep learning predominantly involves convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks, with CNNs being really good for images and RNNs being really good for sequential data. We've talked about some of the applications of those. We've talked about broadly how they work. Once you've trained your model and you want to then apply it to healthcare, it's important to make sure that uh, it works well and that also it is having a positive clinical impact. So that's what we're going to talk about in the next couple of videos.